Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. I'm Margaret Mims from the Department of Learning and Interpretation here at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Today, we continue our celebration of the exhibition Peacock in the Desert, the Royal Arts of Jodhpur, India. Organized by the Museum of Fine Arts Houston in partnership with the Marangar Museum Trust of Jodhpur, the exhibition showcases nearly four centuries of artistic creation from the Marwar Jodhpur region, one of the largest princely states in India, located in the northwestern Indian state of Rajasthan. I know that's a lot of words, but just think Northwest India. The city of Jodhpur was established in the 15th century and became the powerful capital of Marwar, a vast desert kingdom ruled by the Rathors, who are descendants of a hereditary social caste of Hindu warriors and kings known as Kshatriyas. And excuse me for those of you who actually can pronounce these words. <laughs> Jodhpur prospered over the next few centuries, and because of that pr prosperity, it attracted the attention of two successive empires who ruled India. First, the Mughals, who ruled northern India from the early 16th century to the mid-19th century, and of course then, the British, whose presence had been in India since the early 17th century, but who took full control of India in 1858. For the city of Jodhpur and its rulers, both of these encounters, first with the Mughals and then with the British, reshaped Jodhpur's cultural landscape, introducing objects, artists, languages, architectural styles, and systems of administration that would influence the royal identity of the Rathor dynasty. The exhibition features approximately 250 objects from all aspects of royal life in Jodhpur, most of which have never been seen outside of Jodhpur. So it's a real treat for us to have them here in Houston. But together, these objects show us how the ruling family of Jodhpur, the Rathors, acquired and commissioned objects that reflect the various cross-cultural exchanges that they encountered and how they used those exchanges to leverage patronage, diplomacy, matrimonial alliances, trade, and even conquest. Now the focus of our lecture this afternoon is the extraordinary Rathor ruler of the early 19th century, Maharaja Man Singh. Born in 1783, Man Singh allied, allied with the religious order of Hatha yogis while he was still a prince of Jodhpur. Then he seized his rightful place on the throne from his Marwar Jodhpur rivals, and he ruled as a devotee of the yogis resisting British rule until his death in 1843. Where the exhibition Peacock in the De Desert offers us this vast overview uh, of the history of the Rathors who founded Jodhpur in 1459, our lecture this afternoon focuses on the contributions and the legacy of one individual king. These lectures are funded by the Brown Foundation, Inc. here in Houston, and on behalf of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, I want to again extend a very deeply appreciative thanks to the Brown Foundation for generously supporting this lecture series, which, by the way, we are presenting as the 42nd annual Ruth K. Charter Lecture Series funded by the uh, Brown Foundation. Uh, Ruth Shardell was a longtime benefactor of our museum, and um, the, her dear friend, Alice Pratt Brown, who served 26 terms as a museum trustee, established these uh, lectures in, in, in her memory in 1976. And now, I'd like to invite Dr. Amy Poster, who is a curator emerita of Asian art at the Brooklyn Museum, and now consulting curator of Asian art here at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, to do the honors of introducing our speaker for today's lecture. Amy? Thank you, Margaret, and welcome to everybody this afternoon. As you can see, the MFA Houston is a place that believes in ongoing and important traditions, in education and outreach. Well, I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce you and introduce our guest speaker today, because she and I also have a long-standing friendship and have been colleagues in the field since she was a graduate student in New York at Columbia University. What's really exciting about our guest speaker, Dr. Deborah Diamond, is that here is someone who decided early on in her career to focus on something that excited her, 
the painting tradition of Jodhpur, which became the focus of her dissertation and as well as two extraordinary exhibitions that she curated for the Smithsonian Institution, where she now is as a, then as a curator at the Freer and Sackler Galleries, and now she is the curator of South and Southeast Asian art at the Freer Gallery of Art and the Arthur M. Sackler Galleries in Washington. A specialist in Indian court painting, Deborah curated the award-winning exhibition Garden and Cosmos Royal Painting of Jodhpur in 2008. This exhibition, which traveled widely and uh, reached out to many people, presented something no one had thought of before, the monumentality of one area of paintings from Jodhpur in the most compelling exhibition imaginable. imaginable. I was lucky to see it in several places, but especially in London, where it was beautifully installed. Yoga, the Art of Transformation in 2013, expanded our understanding of the core aspects of yoga as a philosophical and physical practice represented in the art throughout Asia from earliest Indian sculpture through 20th century photography. Deborah's work has been recognized by awards of excellence from many, many institutional and collegial centers, including the Association of Museum Curators, the College Association's Arthur H. Barr Jr. Award, and the Smithsonian Secretary's Research Prizes. And we can especially note that on March 10th of this year, she received from Maharaja Gaj Singh II in Jodhpur the very distinguished Sri Pachap Award, the highest Marangar International Award for her contribution towards research, publication, and exhibition of Marwar paintings. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished friend and colleague, Deborah Diamond. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm really pleased to be here. I just spent an amazing hour and a half in the Peacock in the Desert exhibition and was really blown away and impressed by how extraordinary the work look here. I've seen them in storage in the basements, dusty basements of palaces for many years, and also how compellingly um, the themes are, the works are placed into these large themes and, and laid out. And what I see in the exhibition is that enduring sort of cultural ethoi of the Rator dynasty is laid out. So you get a sense of their values, their martial values, the importance of family and dynasty, um, the role of women. Um, it, I think a, a good sense of sort of tradition and continuity, and but maybe not so much a, a sense of how things actually change on the ground. Um, from reign to reign or from period to period. So today I'm going to focus on one particular reign, that of Maharaja Man Singh, who ruled from 1803 to 1843, because it gives us a sense of how important the, the individual sensibility of any particular ruler is, and um, the agency and the creativity of that particular ruler in order to sort of affect change on the ground and to engage with larger historical formations. And the reason that I pick out Man Singh out of many other creative rulers is one, he was a fabulous patron. And artists in that period really went in new directions that artists in Jodhpur or artists in India had never uh, gone places they had never gone before. They tackled subjects that no one had ever depicted before. Um, two, we know a lot about the rain not least because Man Singh wrote memoirs and some 15 to 20,000 devotional poems and songs are attributed to Man Singh, so he must have written some of those. And we also have an incredible amount of correspondence and memos um, from the British about Man Singh. Um, hundreds, maybe thousands of memos from the British. And all of these are um, these memos are about trying to understand what's actually going on in Jodhpur for these 40 years in which the British are desperately trying to increase their influence in the kingdom. So it's titled The Yogi King of Jodhpur. 
because the way that Man Singh sort of holds on to power over 40 years is to create an alliance with a, with a yogic religious tradition of Hatha Yoga ascetics. And he turns them into an elite, and he uses this elite to um, deflect the power of his own nobility, as well as the encroachments of the British, also Maratha armies, and an Afghan mercenary. And the paintings and manuscripts that he patronizes, as well as the architecture that he has built, actually contribute um, and are really essential to the story. So you get politics and art combined. The two places that I'm talking about today are the capital of Marwar, which is Jodhpur, in the top blue circle. And then in the bottom blue circle, a, a small place named Jalor, which is about an hour and a half drive south of Jodhpur. And in Jalor uh, was the headquarters of this yogic tradition. The headquarters, excuse me, the headquarters in Marwar of this yogic tradition. And they are called the Nats, N-A-T-H-S. So in order to sort of set this up, I'm going to tell you quickly the story of Man Singh's life. Man Singh was the grandson of Maharaja Vijay Singh. And he was orphaned when he was a little boy of four years old. And Vijay Singh adopted Man Singh and groomed him to become the next Maharaja. And in doing this, um, Vijay Singh um, put Man Singh under the care of his consort, not his chief wife, but his consort, Gulab Rai. And then in 17, yeah, 1793, when Man Singh was only 10 years old, Vijay Singh dies. His consort, Gulab Rai, knows that there's going to be like an incredible succession battle and that um, this young orphan boy is, is, is quite insecure. And she sends him away, actually, to Jalor for his own safety. And then she's murdered. And many say that she's murdered in the glass palanquin. We don't know for sure, but it does actually add some texture to visiting the palanquin. So here is Jalord. It's a fortress. It was, it was part of the sort of Rajput, um, the Rator territory. And it's said to be an sort of impregnable fortress. It was a safe place for this young boy, Prince Man Singh. But it was also the site where there was a, a monastery um, and two temples devoted to this Nath religious order. So what happens? Bim Singh. Um, seizes the throne in Jodhpur in 1793, and then he ruthlessly tries to get rid of anybody else who might have a claim on the throne, and he murders them all. And by 1803, there's only one other claimant alive, and that's Man Singh, and he's in Jalor, so Bim Singh sends this big army down there. He gets all the noble, almost all of the noblemen on his side, and they go down and they besiege Jalor Fort, and Man Singh here writes about um, how, how he was besieged and everybody had lost hope. Man Singh actually sends his wife and his son out for their own safety. And he, he, he gives up and he, he says he's going to surrender. He sends down his terms. And then Bim Singh dies um, in Jodhpur, kind of unexpectedly. The general of the Jodhpur army says to Man Singh, OK, quick. We'll go to Jalor together. We'll put you on the throne before anybody else can get their act together. So this is Man Singh speeding off to Jalor. And indeed, he gets to Jodhpur before the other noblemen can actually get together and choose a successor that they would like more. And of course, there's another, there must be another successor that they would like more, because they have been um, part of the previous ruler's um, support group, and they've been attacking Man Singh for the last 10 years. But there's nothing they can do. Um, and so they accept his accession. And this painting by Amar Das depicts the coronation, the Abhishek of Man Singh. You can see him there wearing gold. He's getting um, the tilak of sovereignty put onto his forehead at this moment. And to his right and left are all of the important assembled noblemen. And they're all wearing basically the same clothing, a sort of white gown, and um, sort of gold embroidered. Um, turbans, which would have all have been gifts from the Maharaja. And you see the less important people are um, on the lower levels and to the left, bottom, including women. 
And um, you can see them just there, even though the painting is somewhat water damaged. Now, those are the facts of the story. But Man Singh would tell the story, actually did tell the story in a completely different way. So Man Singh um, says, yes, I was really worried. I sent my wife and my son away. But in fact, I was filled with joy and certainty because he had become a devotee of this Nath. Now, it is unlikely that anyone here would be familiar um, with this sectarian order and their traditions because they were but just one of like hundreds of religious traditions that you would have found in Rajasthan at that period. Now, the, this group, which probably was formed around the 12th century, understood um, that there were these great perfected beings. They're called Maha, Maha's great, like Mahatma Gandhi, Siddhas, perfected beings, who maybe had once been human, but now had these incredible supernatural powers. They lived in a kind of heaven, but they could come down to earth whenever they wanted. And what the not religious tradition taught was that ascetics who followed the precepts of Hatha Yoga, which is a bit different than the Hatha Yoga we practice today, but those ascetics who followed the, the principles of Hatha Yoga, meditation and postures for 12 years, they too could become immortal ascetics with supernatural powers. So it's an incredible recruiting tool if you think about it, because 12 years is not that long. And then they would be able to see really long distances. They could fly. They could burn entire cities with a mere glance. And they had a lot of skill, a big skill set, I'd say. And they did actually become power brokers all over medieval India. So Man Singh is a devotee, especially of this one Mahasiddha named Jalandhar Nath. And this is a painting that's later made in the Jodhpur Atelier depicting Jalandhar Nath. And Jalandhar Nath here is represented like you would see an ascetic who is devoted to the Hindu god Shiva. He's light blue because he has his skin, he, put, he smeared ashes on his skin, which human yogis do. And he has this long hair, which are dreadlocks or jata, which human yogis have. And he's also wearing saffron cloth, which is a color of cloth that holy men, Hindu holy men in India wear. And we know he's immortal and special here because he has a, has a halo. Now, back to the story. So Man Singh is in Jalord. He's being besieged. He's lost all hope. He sent down um, information that he will surrender to Bim Singh's army. And surrendering means dying, clearly, because all of the other contenders have been killed. He sends down this information. And then this Nath priest comes to him and says, wait, I have a message for you from Jalantar Nath. He says, if you could just hold out a few more days until the festival of Diwali, you will become the, the ruler of Jodhpur. So Man Singh waits, and lo and behold, the evil Bim Singh dies, and he rushes off to Jodhpur and becomes the Maharaja. So Man Singh credits his accession to the intercession of the supernatural being. And this painting refers to that um, episode. If you see on the upper left, there's the fort, that's Jalor. And then on the upper right, those little hands dropping down golden flowers, that refers to that miracle. And when Man Singh becomes the ruler, um, and for the next 40 years, one of the things he does is he patronizes hundreds and hundreds of paintings of him interacting with this immortal being. And this particular painting shows Jalandranath as if he's alive. He's present to Man Singh, certainly. Um, and see all the fireworks and the lights? That means it's the, the night of Diwali, the festival of lights. And so this painting commemorates Man Singh's devotion, but it also commemorates that specific miracle that brought him to the throne. And it's also an interesting painting to look at. It's painted around 1825 by one of the important court artists named Shiv Daspati. Um, it's important to look at because it kind of um, exemplifies the style of the, of the atelier at Jodhpur at this time. So what you can see is pretty planar, two-dimensional, very shiny, lots of white, um, and that the forms that, that are created are all kind of rounded and sweeping and enthusiastic. So you see, like, for example, how um, 
how much the, the skirt of Man Singh's robe turns up at the edge. I mean, those are sort of elements that are typical of Jodhpur style at this time. We turn to the coronation painting, just to finish the beginning of his reign. Uh, Man Singh comes to power. The noblemen accept it, but then right away there's already tension, there's trouble, they're not getting their honors. Man Singh seems to have seized their property. And they pretty much get up and they leave Jodhpur entirely within the first year of Man Singh's reign. And that would be the reason I propose, I contend, that this painting was never finished, because there would be no reason to celebrate his alliance with the noblemen if they were all had gone out of town. And I also put a little blue circle on the upper right for no good reason, except that um, there are little doors there with women painted on them, and those doors are in the exhibition. So go back and take a look. Also, right in that period in 1805, Man Singh gets initiated into the Nath religious tradition. So he's being initiated here by his guru, whose name is Devnath. And he, Man Singh brings his guru Devnath to Jodhpur from Jalor, as well as various members of his family. And he turns them into this elite power. Um, they get, depending on the year, between one-tenth and one-fifth of the entire sort of treasury of Jodhpur. So become incredibly wealthy and very powerful. Man Singh says in actually a really beautiful song, Nath, he means Jalantar Nath, Nath Ji is like the intoxication from liquor that dazes. I have become attached to the feet of Nath Ji and I will announce it to the world. And one of the key ways that he announces it to the world is through patronage. And that today we'll look basically at his patronage of paintings that relate to the Nath and sort of how the received in Jodhpur. So we'll look at the paintings first stylistically, and then we'll look at how they transformed these kind of rough and gruff and kind of loose yogis into a powerful elite. And then um, finally, we'll look at the response um, to the yogis. I forgot to say that if anybody has a question, if, if I say a word that's unclear or you need, a, you need a definition, that I would be OK if you broke in. Not for a big concept question, but just to define something. So beginning in 1824, in the second half of the reign of Man Singh, his atelier begins to produce illustrated manuscripts that relate to the Nath. And so first, I want to uh, begin with those, because they give you some idea of Nath teachings. So we'll, you'll know, and if you do Hatha Yoga, you can look for any similarities. Um, you might find between your own practice and the Nath. So these are all the things I'll discuss. I won't read them to you. The first thing I want to do is show you a, a two folios from a little, little small size manuscript um, that's on view upstairs. And this is called the Suraj Prakash, or the Light of the Sun. And this is an illustrated genealogy of, of the Rator dynasty. And it's one of their great and important sort of um, forms, bardic forms, um, by which Rators learned about their own values and learned about their history. And the four folios that are upstairs, they all look basically like this. They're like grids of the ancestors of the Rator dynasty. And they go all the way back to Ram, the great sort of divine prince god, Rama. Um, and they set up this continuity between a Hindu deity and the dynasty. Except that if you actually then turn from page folio four to folio five, you'll see that most of the, this Suresh Prakash is about something else entirely. So what Man Singh's artists did was they took the bulk of the manuscript to illustrate the stories of the obscure King Punja of Kanoj, a 12th century ancestor, and his even more obscure 12 sons. And the reason that uh, they did this, I think, is because those 12 sons were all fledgling princes who became rulers, who became kings because of some divine intercession. 
And sometimes that intercession was even the intercession of a, of a Mahasiddha like Jalantarnath. So this is one folio from one of those stories. And you can see Jalantarnath flying up in the upper right corner. And behind him is a princess that he's enchanted, Padmini. And she's dropping her bracelet. See the little gold circle? She's dropping her bracelet down to that king down there as a sign that she really loves him. Um, and he is one of the ancestors of, he is one of Man Singh's ancestors. And the way that the artist made this composition, it's quite interesting. The artist is attempting to show that Man Singh's ancestor is King Padam, is really handsome and really sexy and attractive. And so he's taken a painting of, of Krishna, the Hindu god Krishna frolicking with the Gopi girls um, that comes from the court of Bundi. And basically, he's just appropriated that and he's put in King Padam instead. So one of the ways in which Man Singh's artists sort of deal with the fact that they have to illustrate stories and ideas that no one else has illustrated before is by appropriating other imagery and then changing it to, to tell these Nath stories. And in doing so, they also take a tradition that's very unfamiliar because Naths were as esoteric then as they are now. Um, they, they make it very understandable by using signs and signifiers that everyone can understand. This painting, by the way, um, was considered a really horrible painting by Western art history for about 100 years. But now we look at it as a, a deeply charming painting. I think it's great. But it was, it was understood as just too bizarre um, for Western art historians for a long time. Now, the rest of the folios that I'm going to show you today come from these monumental large manuscripts where each folio is about three, three and a half feet across. Has everybody here seen the exhibition? Oh, so you know these folios. These are uh, opaque watercolor, lots of gold um, on paper, and they were never bound because Indian manuscripts of Hindu courts are never bound. And I believe that they were, we have no documentation about how they were shown, but I believe that they were held up, someone held them up, to show them to the ruler and, and a gathered court. Why do I think this is the way they were looked at? Well, one thing is nobody's arms are long enough to actually hold them up. And kings don't really do that much to them, and everything is pretty much done for them anyway. And Man Singh was committed to to disseminating the teachings of the Nath. So it's likely that someone was there explaining what these teachings were. Even Man Singh wouldn't have known of most of them. This is the first page folio of one of those Nath manuscripts, the Nath Purana, so the ancient tradition of the Nath. Um, and like, like a small, small sort of normative sized um, Hindu manuscript, it has a, a, an, an image of Ganesha the um, Hindu deity who blesses all good beginnings. And manuscripts often begin with an image of Ganesha, or they begin with an image of Saraswati. She's in the middle there, because she's the goddess of knowledge. So these are big. They can do whatever they want. Um, so they put on Ganesh, and they put on Saraswati. And then they add a special heavenly ashram that's filled with Naths. So in this way, again, bringing these uh, Naths into um, in familiar ways, bringing them into kind of the very fabric of, of how um, Hindus and Rators and, and Rajputs would kind of understand knowledge, um, legend, stories, and authority. Some of the folios, I mean, mm, there's some 350 folios from, from four or five manuscripts that relate to the Naths, are particularly about Nath teachings. Hatha yoga, which uses meditation and postures, is very much about knowledge that you would gain through a manipulation of the mind and body. In Indian traditions, mind and body are one. Um, and one of the ways that this happens is through understanding um, a physiology, a physiology of what's called the subtle body. And the subtle body is composed um, of energy centers called chakras. So what this folio is showing us um, is the chakras that are on, on the body of a yoga. So the yogi, you know he's a yogi because one, he's wearing orange. Two, he's got that light blue body because it's smeared with ashes. Um, and three, he's got those dreadlocks. Except here his dreadlocks are kind of turned and kind of like a 50s style bouffant. 
but there's still, there's still dreadlocks. This was esoteric knowledge then, but Mansingh collected Nath manuscripts from all over Rajasthan, all over India, and the Himalayas. And one of the ones that came in that's still in the library today in Jodhpur is a very crude, hastily painted little image that explains those energy centers of the body. And so we can see if we compare these two images, what the Jodhpur royal artists did. They took information, like I'm looking at the lowest chak chakra, which is a four-petaled red chakra um, that has the, the letter G, G on it um, because it relates to Ganesh or Ganapati. And what the royal artists did was they took all of their skills in creating images and beautiful glowing images, and so they took that little diagram and that piece of knowledge and they turned it into the visual language of the court. So there is Ganesh, he's there with both of his wives, and he's on a red four-petaled lotus, but it's glowing. Right? The artists have used shading and contrasting colors in order to create something that's um, sort of beautifully painted and then lightly kind of shimmering through the use of modulated colors. You all have heard of chakras, right? Okay. Now, this folio comes from a, a manuscript. It is like the sort of foundational text of the Nath tradition, which is called the, the Siddhanta Padati. We, it was begun in the 12th century. And in the beginning of that text, it says, in order to sort of become an immortal ascetic, you have to know the body. And so it gives these sort of these steps on how to do this. And this painting shows you the goal. It says, and in the 12th year, you will become an immortal being, and you will understand that you are the same as the universe. So this painting depicts the yogi, again, you see the yogi standing there in the Tadasana posture, as if he's the universe. And it's using this um, Indic conception of the universe as kind of 14 worlds stacked vertically. The painting on the right is a painting from the Jain religious tradition, and it's called the Lok Purush, and you see those, it's small, I guess about a foot high, and you can see those um, sort of 14 vertical worlds stacked on the body. So the difference is, um, for the Jains, this is like a conception of the universe. For the Nas, this is what you'll become if you go through the 12-year program. And then once you're immortal, you know, you can do all these things. You can stay up there. You can come down. You can help fledgling kings. You can do, you know, sort of whatever you want. If we look at a close-up of this, we can see how finely the artist has uh, shaded and modulated all the forms and how he's shown the different worlds as these white walled cities. See, the, see in this yogi's hair, you see those cities up in his hair. So each world, each, each lok is shown as a white walled city. All of the mountains that are in the universe are named in the text. Um, his eyes are shaped like lotuses because that's a sign of beauty. He looks cross-eyed, right? But that's because his eyes are sort of turned inward in meditation. Um, the artist has taken the sun and the moon, which is the ha and ta of hatha yoga, and made them into his cheeks, like rouge. Um, and then he's taken clouds and made a sort of little beard. It's very clever. And mountains have become his ear hair. And um, you can also see a little bit with the necklace of pearls where the artist has used sort of raised paint in order to sort of create this image of a massive and monumental yogic figure. And this kind of long lesson that you've just had on what the body was about is, is what I think they were telling the court at that time. It relates to the text and it explains the greatness of Nats. I'm yes. going to take you up because I have a fast question, which is, um, are there seven chakras or more? And is that a lotus coming out of the crown chakra or something else? You asked a very good question if there are seven. This person said, are there seven lotuses or more? And is that lotus on the top of his head a crown chakra? 
actually in all of the different chakra traditions we find all over India, even within the Nath, there's always a different number of chakras. So the number seven is the kind of a number that got standardized in the 20th century. It's like very Indian that there actually is no one standard. So even on paintings from this court, you get different numbers of chakras from the same court, same period. And then on this conception of the universe, yes, the chakra at the top is the Sahasra chakra, the sort of 1,000 petal lotus. The next concept that I want to explain is what, um, what's the basis, the fundamental basis of the universe according to the Nas and according to many Hindu traditions. So in many Hindu traditions, um, what you have that's really fundamental and it's essential and it's always, it's always here, is an absolute transcendent being who has no color, no form, no time, no history, no shape, um, just an all-pervading essence. The only quality it really has is that it's luminous. So this is so important and it's so important to many Hindu traditions, but nobody ever illustrates it. It just doesn't come up. It's not quite something that's worshipped. And so for the first time, really, what we have in Jodhpur is artists who grapple with how do you show this absolute, the absolute um, formless essence of the universe. And they choose to do that with, with a solid gold square. It's kind of like color field painting. And so on this manuscript folio here, um, it moves from left to right. And the folios show you the gradual sort of creation of the universe. First, you have just the absolute essence, nothing else. Then you have the creation of matter. Purush and Prakriti is matter and spirit, shown as a king and a queen. And then here again is matter and spirit, right? They've just been, they've just been sort of created, taken form out of that formless absolute. And then they create the god Vishnu and the cosmic ocean. Vishnu sleeps on the cosmic ocean. He creates Brahma. Brahma, da, da, da. eventually you get down to humans. Here's another folio that explains the same concept um, of a formless absolute. And in this, for this manuscript, the first manifestation of being is actually a kind of an essence that is a Nath yogi. So I can cut forward and say that like most of the noblemen and certainly the British, British East India Company hated the Naths. They really did not want them in the kingdom at all. And so we can partially understand these uh, manuscripts as, as, a, as a way of telling people why the Naths are important through their teachings, their sublime teachings. Here is the radical formless absolute. And here is its first manifestation as the same kind of Mahasiddha you've seen before ochre clothing of holy men, ash smeared body, and then the little dreadlocks, which over time in Jodhpur painting turn into kind of a little page boy. Um, and then they consistently begin to wear little triangular black hats, and they have big earrings at this point that they wear through holes cut into the upper cartilage of their ears, which I now sometimes see um, youngish men sporting, um, like a hole right at the top bit. Man Singh's artists, he has about 25 artists in the atelier, and they become um, really involved with trying to sort of explain the complexity and beauty of a universe that's filled with knots. So they use that same grid technology that we saw in the Suraj Prakash, and they use it to um, show how knots pervade the universe. These are just many folios of knots pervading the universe in different ways. And remember, there's hundreds of these folios that would have been held up. And the aesthetic here is about, it's about glimmer, gleam, shine, repetition, about like creating like a hypnotic and dazzling intensity. And if we look really closely at any single painting, you can also see that the Nas, not the Nas, sorry, that the Jodhpur uh, Atelier are brilliant at color, at color harmonies. They use colors here that nobody else has used in any other Indian court and maybe never since. So if you look, for example, just at the river on the bottom, you have silver, and then you have kind of sage green, then you have salmon pink, and then you've got that color like a margarita, like a frozen margarita. 
So that sort of silver green salmon margarita, you just, when you go upstairs and you look at paintings from this period, that's what I encourage you to do is sort of savor these sort of like wonderful and strange harmonies. And if we look close, you'll see that every mountain is inhabited by ascetics and yogis. Again, sort of this idea of coloration, they're creating here like a, a, like a kind of a magical pink world. These are all militant ascetics, by the way. Um, but the artist has used sort of a pink wash to sort of create this magical world. Now, militant ascetics, they're shown here, is actually um, kind of an important component of the North Indian landscape. Mm, maybe through the 18th century, they were sort of a major part of the, of the freelance um, military in Northern India, were ascetics who were also fighters. And for Nats who were also fighters, their, their sort of reputation as good fighting men was enhanced by the fact that they were thought to have uh, magical powers. Here are examples from two, two paintings upstairs with extraordinary color harmonies to link these for you. Um, and sometimes this is um, paintings of seven cosmic oceans. We see them using these sort of color, thinking across paintings and thinking across series. White, just using texture to show the, uh, and then like tang, like this is the color of tangerines or tang to create these, these oceans. This is some kind of um, heavenly plane in which great Mahasiddhas live. The last sort of um, aesthetic I want to show you is that they were really concerned with kind of an op art kind of optical intensity. This is the god Shiva looking over a landscape. If you look close, you'll see how they use shading, silver and green, in order to create a kind of a shimmer. The paintings are disconcerting. They're trippy, I think is the word I've used. Here is a mandala, again, depicting um, the universe. And here, again, that strategy of, of sort of creating paintings that draw you out of an ordinary viewing space um, into contact with a, with a sublime or heavenly space. In the last few minutes of my talk, what I want to talk about is what actually happened with the Nats in Jodhpur in these 40 years. So our earliest painting, 1803, the first year of, of Man Singh's reign, we see a, a painting of Man Singh with, this is the uncle of his guru, and they're worshiping Jalandharnath, and Jalandharnath is shown in the form of feet, or chadan. Um, and prior to, to Man Singh, I, I, I don't think there are any paintings of Nath. I don't, I don't think that they're worshiped like that. And if there's a sacred site devoted to the Mahasiddhas, what you get is these feet, these symbols, these traces of their presence. And if you look at the um, Harnath on the left, he, he looks like a priest. He does not look like a, a Rajput or a Rator in any way. He's essentially different. But over time, the priests come to look more and more like Man Singh. So in this painting, what we have is Jalandharnath. Now, all of a sudden, he's real. This happens within the first two years of the reign. He's real. He, he looks like he's really present to Man Singh. Um, and Man Singh is praying to him, as are his Ranis. And these paintings were used for a form of worship, we know from the records, called Chitra Darshan, which means looking at the picture. And so if you worship the painting, you are actually worshiping Jalantarnath. This was a, a religious practice that, again, they appropriated from a Krishna, uh, Krishna devotional tradition. And here is, this is upstairs, I believe, in the exhibition. We see Vijay Singh um, worshiping Krishna, and then just an update on that tradition into a Nath register. But if Krishna in, in the painting on the left is looking forward, is always looking forward, like anyone can have the darshan of Krishna, Jalandharnath is only ever looking at Man Singh. So there's this kind of intense relationship between the two of them. And then over these 40 years, they produce hundreds, maybe more than a thousand, uh, paintings of Man Singh worshiping Jalandharnath in every season. Here they're doing it in Holi. Um, here they're, they're doing it in the mon monsoon season. And the records tell us that Man Singh did Chitra Darshan every day, or he had somebody do it on his own behalf, or he had other people who had to do it, but they just had to pretend they were doing it. It was very clear. You just had to act like you 
um, were okay with the Nas. He, didn't have to, he says, you don't have to believe it in your heart. Then he builds over 90 temples. This is the great temple that's one of three temples that's in Jodhpur called Maha Mandir, which means great temple. Looks like a typical North Indian temple tower at top. Looks kind of like a Sufi Darga at bottom. And um, he has paintings made of him worshiping Jalantarnath within the space of the temple. And you can see he's showing that the temple is right near Jodhpur. So what he does, and this is one of the ways in which the Nas get really, really rich, is he builds them a suburb. It has 1,000 homes, there's 112 markets, it collects taxes, it can provide sanctuary to anyone it wants, which makes it very powerful, because they can protect anyone they want to. Um, and the paintings of, of these places show that relationship to Jodhpur, and they show the city in the process of being constructed. This painting depicts um, the temple there is at the lower right, and at the top I'm showing you the mansion of his guru Devnath. And I just want to show a close-up of this. So Devnath is on the left, so he's the Nath. Man Singh is on the right. Both of them are being shown with their sons. Now the logic of Rajput, North Indian Hindu court portraiture, is the more you look like the king, the more powerful you are. So this is no longer a holy man dressed in orange. This is someone who looks almost exactly like the king. And he looks so much like Man Singh that every now and then in like Sotheby's catalogs, you'll see a painting that's labeled Maharaja Man Singh, but it's really one of these yogis. And you know they're the yogis because of the earrings that they're wearing. And if you look at the painting really closely, who's taller? The Nath. Who's got the bigger pillow? The Nath. So you can see even with here that the, that the Guru is being positioned as more powerful than Man Singh. And then if we go to the outside of this, you can see um, there's a combination of plan and elevation that are very much like the construction drawings of Maha Mandir. So they're also showing um, the sort of the newness, the construction of the city, Man Singh's power to sort of allocate funds and give them to the Nath and create the separate center. Man Singh's guru is murdered in 1815 by the nobility, that they really hate him. Um, and so Man Singh's, um, um, sorry, the guru's son then becomes the like, chief, chief Nath, the chief guru. And he has a painting made, 1825, 1830, of his own darbar. So, I just wanted to show this because all of the rock tour darbars we see upstairs are horizontal, first among equals, but not the Nas because they are really, really, they have moved, they move from being holy men to being powerful holy men to being audacious, um, audacious nobility like within two decades. So he's there, he's giving out these little um, bags of gold and down below are all the bards who would write about him. Um, and write good things, one would hope, about him. So he's, he's creating his own power base. So we've seen um, over the course of the last 45 minutes um, that during Man Singh's reign, he takes these obscure kind of scruffy yogis, he turns them into a powerful elite. He does that in part by um, finding stories of, of the Rator past that happen to include these Mahasiddhas. He, um, and we've also seen like how they change from looking like yogis or holy men to acting and behaving like nobility because they have this massive amount of money um, and they also get their own armies um, over the course of this time and how they get audacious and actually they get, um, they get corrupted. Um, so they begin to, for example, um, abduct and rape um, Brahmin and Rajput women would be the biggest example. Um, so, how does this play out? The noblemen murder the first guru in 1815. Man Singh becomes a recluse. He lives like a yogi um, in the palace. Um, his son becomes the, becomes the Maharaja. While his son is the Maharaja, the British sign a treaty, um, presuming Man Singh's consent. Um, that lets them come in um, into the kingdom and have power in the kingdom. The prince dies. Man Singh returns to power. The British um, create a kind of, they, they broker a rapprochement between Man Singh and his noblemen, 
all the noblemen come back. The British are like, okay, we've got this covered. He's back. It's 1818. But nope. After a year and a half, Munsing like, like kind of kills them all in one night. Doesn't work out well. They leave. They return. There are civil wars. This goes on for the next 20 years. And it's in that climate that Monsing is having all of these large manuscripts made. Um, the British are constantly trying to figure out what's going on with Monsing. They don't know if he's a wily politician or if he's in the thrall of evil yogis. Um, and, but they can't really take it anymore because it's impeding their revenue chain. So in 1843, they, uh, they arrest Tunath um, for abducting a Brahmin girl and holding her for ransom. And they put the Naths into jail. And Mansing meets with the British representative and says, please, you, you have to release them. This has, it has to do with, with my, my salvation. And they refuse to do that. And so Mansing sort of takes off all his royal clothing and he puts on the simple garb of a holy man and he leaves the palace and he never returns. He goes and lives in a tent until he catches a summer fever and he dies. So um, after that, um, kind of yogis, they, they like fade back into the landscape. Some say they were murdered. Um, they certainly don't get any more state support. And then all of these paintings got put away. Like the British put another um, ruler back on the throne. He was also upstairs. Um, and that ruler like has some sort of more normative religious leanings. Um, so all of these paintings were just put away and they were like kept in storage uh, until like the 1990s. And that's my story. Thank you very much. <laughs>